Level 6 Sorcerer spells continue the trend that the Level 5 Sorcerer spells started in being more complex than those that came before. So level six spells kind of have multiple functions in general, uh, which makes them a great value for each spell slot. Generally, it's meant for these spells to last you a little bit longer or maybe make a bigger impact without having to waste additional spell slots of lower levels. There are a lot of spells that are utility. There are a few spells that are for blasting and damage. It's a, it's a decent mix of spells. So let's go ahead and break each level six sorcerer spell down as we've been doing in this series. If you haven't seen the other episodes in this series, you can check them out. I'll link them in the video description down below. This is a part of a very large series of videos for the sorcerer class in fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Welcome to the Twisted Tentacle Inn. I'm your innkeeper and today we'll be talking about level six sorcerer spells. Before we begin, I want to give a big thank you to my patrons. I really appreciate what you guys do. You support the channel tremendously. If you want to help support the channel and you are not one of my patrons, you can join by clicking the link in the video description. For only a dollar a month, you get early access to all of my videos, as well as permanent ad-free versions of those videos if you ever want to watch them without having to watch ads. Thank you guys. And you can also support the channel in other ways, such as clicking the like or the subscribe button. All right, so let's go ahead and get started without further ado with the first spell, Arcane Gate. Arcane Gate is a teleportation spell. It opens a portal between two points within 500 feet of each other. It's basically a dimension door, but with a few less limitations. The biggest concern I have with this spell is that anyone can use the portal while it's open. So it's not ideal for combat. It's better for utility and exploration, I think. This is because if you cast it to get away from a creature, that creature, that creature can just follow right through the gate along with you guys and just continue the battle wherever it is that you teleported to. So that's that's a bit of a drawback if you're trying to use this in combat. And of course, you can still use some maneuvering and tactics to make it work, uh, but it's not as easy to pull off in combat as, say, a Misty Step or, some, or a Dimension Door, let's say. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, this spell works much better than any previous teleportation spell available to sorcerers when it comes to utility and exploration. The best meta magic to use with this one, depending on the situation, I would say is distance spell and extended spell. Very few other meta magic work with this one, but as a utility spell, you know, it's that's fine. Next up is Chain Lightning. This spell is a blasting spell that has a great range of 150 feet. And basically what it does is you shoot a target within range and then you can shoot up to three more targets within 30 feet of that original target. So really the range of this spell can be as high as 180 feet without using any meta magic. And I'm gonna show a little diagram here on how that works. It deals pretty good damage and targets dexterity, which is a middle of the road saving throw that you, you wanna target. Uh, this spell sometimes gets ignored, but it does have several benefits. First of all, it doesn't have any friendly fire. That's huge if you're indoors or inside a dungeon. A spell like Fireball is very hard to pull off when everyone's in the thick of it. A spell like this is very, very good for a situation like that and can still deal potentially a lot of damage to several targets. The second good thing about this spell is that you can target a creature or an object. So... This increases the utility functions of the spell if you need to break through a door or bars or something like that. And of course, upcasting the spell is also really good since you can target another creature for another 10d8 damage each time. It's unique as a blast spell in that way. There's very few spells that allow you to pick an additional target for blasting by upcasting the spell or increasing the area of effect or whatever. So kind of unique in that way and very few level six spells 
uh, have any good upcasting capabilities. So this is one of the few. And upcasting in this way is, I think, better than just increasing the dice by an additional 2d8 or whatever, because you're adding an additional target for an additional 10d8. Now, lightning damage is resisted fairly commonly, which is unfortunate, but transmuted spell can really go a long way with this spell like this. And distance spell can also help a lot if your enemies are far away, but not if they're far away from each other because the range only affects the range between you and the first target. Every other target still has to be within 30 feet of that one, unfortunately. Empowered spell does work great here if your dungeon master plays this one as I believe it was in intended and allows one set of dice you know, rolls for all the targets at the same time, as opposed to making you roll 10 D eight for each target and then making you use meta magic for each target individually. Hopefully your DM doesn't, doesn't make you do that. That would be really, really mean, but there are some DMS that I'm sure out there have done this exact same thing. Next up is Circle of Death. Clearly the biggest draw for this spell is the absolutely massive area of effect. The damage seems pretty low at 8d6, but you can potentially land this on way more creatures than most other blast spells, which means that your damage output could potentially be higher. In my experience though, it's very rare where you have creatures either that spread out where you're going to need to have such a large blast area, unless you're fighting an army or something like that. I seriously doubt that you're going to be facing a lot of moments where this large area of effect is actually going to be of, of much use. That's not to say that this is bad. In fact, if you manage to make use of such a large area of effect, it's going to blow everybody's mind with the amount of damage that you're going to deal to so many creatures. I'm just saying don't expect it to happen very often is all. But also, I don't think it's realistic to expect this spell to outdamage and upcast Fireball, let's say, very often, just based on how many creatures you can affect with one casting. Yes, the damage type of Necrotic is less commonly resisted than Fire, but the Constitution saving throw is a huge drawback here, and it's going to bring that down a peg. It's a lot less common for creatures to resist Dexterity than for them to be um, good at con constitution saving throws, which means you're going to have a lot more creatures succeeding their saves and taking half damage. So even though you're facing creatures that have higher fire resistance, let's say, and you fireball them, you may still actually deal a little bit more than you would with this spell because they're still, they're more likely to fail their saving throw than the creatures that you're going to hit with this spell. The Honestly, the real drawback of this spell, though, is the lack of any secondary effect. By this level, spells should be doing more than just damage. Let's be honest. For example, the fifth level spell, Synaptic Static. That one has a great debuff, and a spell like Chain Lightning, let's say, has a safety feature that's going to allow your allies to be safe. So even something like that would have been nice in this spell. Unfortunately, it doesn't have anything other than just the damage, kind of like Cone of Cold in, in fifth level. It, it's just unfortunate that these spells at such a high level are just damage, and that's it. And it's not even that great of a damage. So with all that said, I just don't think that the large area of effect is enough for me to recommend this spell for sorcerers. I think for a wizard, this spell is great. I think for a warlock, this spell is also great because it's a circumstantial spell. There's going to be very few instances where you're going to need to hit such a large area, but when you do, it's going to blow people's minds, right? So therefore, someone like a wizard or warlock can have that spell sitting there for when you need it. As a sorcerer, you can't afford to do that because you have such few spells known. You're not going to want to have a spell known that is going to be circumstantial in terms of its potential and its use. And then, of course, upcasting it is just not that good. I don't recommend you upcast this spell. Increasing the damage by 2d6 for each upcast level is just not enough. <laughs> upcast Chain Lightning instead and, and go that route. 
And as far as meta magic features, I think Empowered Spell can go a long way to making the spell do a lot more damage. So that's good. And then Distance Spell will increase the range to 300 feet, which is pretty awesome. But again, still don't recommend this spell. Disintegrate. This one is a single target blast spell that deals great damage, but it has a few limitations that make it a questionable choice. So let's look at the good things first. 10d6 plus 40 is amazing damage, and it's force damage, the least resisted damage type in the game. It's single target, so there's no chance of friendly fire, and it's great in tight quarters or if you're fighting like a boss enemy or in a small room or something like that. It can also target objects and magical effects like Wall of Force. This makes it more versatile and useful in different situations. But this spell isn't perfect. The range is just not great. 60 feet is pretty bad range for a spell of 6th level and that spell that deals this much damage. You will be the center of attention when you hit an enemy with this if you don't kill it or if you miss. They will come running after you and 60 feet is just not enough of a gap in distance for you to feel safe when that happens. And of course the dexterity saving throw is just okay. Uh, a spell like this really should be targeting a, a saving throw that's much harder for enemies to resist because if they succeed, the big drawback of this spell is that they take zero, zero damage. They take nothing at all. That's horrible for a six level spell to just waste your turn casting a spell that absolutely does nothing. You're, if you're trying to save this for a boss creature, a lot of boss creatures at this level are going to have legendary resistance. And guess what they're going to use that legendary resistance on? This spell. They succeed their saving throw and now they take zero damage. Terrible. Just terrible. I can't believe that they put that in this, in this game at this level. It's just... Uh, terrible choice and i really don't think that it's a spell that you should be taking specifically for that reason now that said you're a sorcerer so there are some reasons why you may want to take this spell it's going to be costly but you do have options and ways to ensure that this lands unlike a wizard or whoever else can take this spell you do have ways to increase your chances of succeeding in nailing the spell. For example, the heightened spell metamagic will grant disadvantage on the saving throw. That can go a long way to making this succeed. You can also use a spell like uh, Mind Sliver to decrease the creature's saving throw. So if you use Quicken Spell, Mind Sliver, or cast Mind Sliver, then Quicken Spell Disintegrate, at least they'll be subtracting a, you know, a dice, a D4, I believe, from their saving throw against it. That's that's not bad. The other thing that you can do, which is fantastic, is twin spell. Yes, it's going to be very expensive. At this level, it's going to cost you six sorcery points to twin this spell, but targeting two creatures now with one spell slot, you are far more likely to hit at least one of them, right? So at least you'll be able to make more use out of this. Again, these are all expensive options because you're going to be using meta magic on this. So it's not necessarily ideal, but if you absolutely need it, it's there in case you do. And then, of course, I mentioned the range. Distant spell is another great choice here because now you can actually be 120 feet away and be at a safer distance. So even if the attention does go to you, you'll at least have a very nice gap in distance from the enemy that you're trying to target. Now, unfortunately, Subtle Spell doesn't work very well here. Even if you Subtle, people are going to know that you cast this spell because a green ray is going to shoot from your finger. Therefore, it's pretty clear who casts this spell because the green ray emerges from your finger and then targets the enemy. So don't try to Subtle Spell this spell. They will know you cast it. Um, overall, I think this spell is mediocre. I think for a sorcerer, it's a good spell. It's not one that I would highly recommend. I think it's good if you're willing to spend the resources on it. Um, in fact, let's take it back from good spell. We'll call it situationally good. So there it goes. <laughs> and one of the few six level spells 
that actually upcasts decently. Adding 3d6 to the damage for every spell cast above 6 is not bad. I think that that is a decent scaling for this spell. I think with the right meta magic, this could be a good choice. So we'll say because it requires good meta magic for it to work, we'll call it a conditionally good spell. Next up is Eye Bite. This is one of my favorite spells in the game. There's just something really cool about it thematically and all that. Eye Bite is just oozing with theme and flavor. I love it. It lasts for a minute. It requires concentration, but it allows you to issue debuffs and control to creatures every single round with just the casting of the one spell. So when you first cast this spell, you can target one creature within 60 feet. Not great range. But hey, it is what it is. But that creature gets to make a wisdom saving throw or it suffers one of the ill effects that you can create from a list, that you can choose from a list. The best one is clearly a sleep, which basically takes the creature completely out of the combat. But the other options are good too. Each round, you can use your action to target a different creature. Even if one creature is affected, it is still affected when you target another creature. So that's what's really cool about this spell. And it can sa save you a ton of spell slots, giving you basically a special action ability that you can use every round with the casting of just one slot. And with Quicken Spell, you can effectively eye bite each round and then also quicken other spells. So you'll be doing two things at each round. Not bad at all. So asleep, the target's going to be asleep until an ally wakes them up by using an action or if they take damage. The great thing is that you can still target them with other spells as long as you're not dealing damage and it's not gonna wake them up. That's really cool. So you can cast web, hold person, or anything else and that's not gonna wake them up. That's pretty awesome. And if you're thinking, why don't just upcast sleep as a six level spell? There's no saving throw, whereas this one grants a saving throw. Yeah, it's true, but a six level sleep spell affects 15 D8 hit dice which averages to 65 hit points. So at this level, that's just not a whole lot. Plus sleep doesn't discriminate, so you can put your allies to sleep, which is probably what's going to happen. Uh, and of course, it just happens the one time. Whereas with this spell, you can target individual creatures every single round. So that's pretty cool. The next ability that it grants you is Panicked. So the target suffers the Frightened condition and has to dash away from you. The effect only ends if they're 60 feet away from you and can't see you. So if they're within 30 feet or even in, if they're in darkness or obscurement, they're still affected. They're going to suffer the effects of the frightened condition and they have to take the dash action. So they don't have to see you once they're affected by this. That's pretty cool. And if there's nowhere to move, they don't have to dash, but they're still going to be frightened, which means they can't come closer to you. It's a great effect, but a lot of creatures at this level honestly are immune to the fear condition. So it becomes a suboptimal choice in those cases. And then the final effect that you can pick is Sickened. This one, the target has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. It's just too bad on this one that they get to sit, make a saving throw every round. And if they succeed, they're no longer going to be affected by it. This makes it the worst of all the effects, unless your enemy is immune to fear or sleep effects, in which case then this becomes the optimal choice, unfortunately. Overall, having the ability to debuff enemies with just one casting makes this spell great value. And unfortunately, distance spell doesn't work on this one. You still have that 60 foot range, regardless of whether you use distance spell or not. That would have been a huge boost to this, but it is what it is. I still think it's a great spell. Heightened spell works here, but only against the first target when you first cast a spell. Although it might still be worth it, right? I do love this spell, and I think I might be biased here, but I highly recommend it.
Next up is Globe of Invulnerability. This one is a powerful defensive spell. It lasts for a minute and requires concentration. Basically, it creates a 10-foot radius globe that blocks spells and spell effects of 5th level or lower. The globe doesn't move with you. I made a video about Globe of Invulnerability and or I made a video for a top 10 and I mentioned that this moves with you. It does not move with you, unfortunately. Thank you to, I forget the person that, that mentioned that. Thank you for correcting me on that. This globe stays where you cast it, unfortunately, but it allows you to move out of it and cast spells and then move back in and be safe from spells. So in a way, the fact that it doesn't move with you is actually pretty, pretty good and maybe even better than if it did move with you. I think this spell works best for blasting specialists because it keeps you safe and then you're able to step outside cast your blasting spell and then move back in the best part is that if a lower level spell is upcast above fifth level they're still affected by the spell and blocked so if a fireball is upcast to a ninth level it's still blocked by the spell because the original fireball spell is third level which means that this spell blocks it that's a really cool ability and i can't think of any other spell in the game that does something like that that's interesting and it makes it very uniquely powerful in that regard. This spell is one of the best defensive spells in the game when it comes to battling against spellcasters. You don't have to waste an action casting dispel magic or reaction casting counter spell or spell slots. You cast the one spell slot or the one spell and it's there for the duration. And it's basically like a nonstop counter spell against things that are trying to affect you. And if, say, an ally is affected by a debuff or a debilitating spell, have them come in or have someone drag them into the globe of invulnerability and the debuff goes away. So if they're, say, hold, someone cast hold person on someone, drag your ally into the globe and they're no longer held while they're in the globe. It's suppressed, but they do have to stay in the globe. <laughs> Otherwise, they're gonna, the effect is going to come back. Uh, it's even better if you upcast this spell because it scales really well, affecting all spells one level lower than the level it was upcast to. So if you upcast this to a ninth level spell, you're going to block all spells of eighth level or lower, which is safe to say that 99% of spells that are cast against you are going to be blocked. Not a whole lot of meta magic that I would recommend here, except maybe subtle spell to prevent a caster from countering it when you're initially casting it. Investiture of Flame. The first of the Investiture spells that we're going to be discussing today, this one lasts for 10 minutes, which requires concentration. For the duration, you emit light for a total of 60 feet, 30 foot bright, and then 30 foot dim light. You're immune to fire damage, and you have resistance to cold damage. If a creature moves next to you, they take 1d10 fire damage. That's not a whole lot, and honestly, fire is highly resisted, but it could be a good deterrent, you know, for some low hit point creatures to come near, to not come near you. That's nice, but it's not all that the spell does. You also gain an action ability, which allows you to shoot a 15 foot line of fire. It's a dexterity saving throw to take half damage. So you're going to be dealing at least some damage every round, even if the creatures save. 48 per round is not too bad. But when you think about lower level spells, you begin to realize that this one is not quite as good as it looks. So when you think about it, the 48 does beat cantrip damage, but at this level, cantrips are going to do close to the same damage. Sure, you're guaranteed to at least do some damage with this one versus cantrips that have the potential to fail. So that's a good thing. But overall, cantrips are going to have way better range than 15 feet. So I'd rather cast a cantrip every round instead of using my action to shoot this 15 foot ray of fire. Um, Distance spell is not going to boost that range either, so you're stuck at 15 feet with this fire blast. It's not going to go any longer than that. It's just not worth putting yourself in danger. 15 feet puts you right in the thick of things. Why in the world would you want to be there as a sorcerer? <laughs> you're not, so there's no way that you're going to be using this every single round unless you want to be taking hits from creatures. 
You're also going to have to consider that if you're fighting creatures that deal fire damage, they're usually going to be immune or resistant to fire themselves. So fire attacks become much less appealing. So let's say you're fighting a red dragon that's shooting fire damage and you want to become immune to it. So you cast a spell on yourself. The immunity is the only thing you're going to benefit from because first of all, you're not going to get close to that dragon 15 feet close to it to shoot it with a little bit of fire. And that dragon's probably going to be resistant or immune to fire anyways. Now compare this to the fourth level spell, Storm Sphere. You get a bonus action attack that has a range of 60 feet from its center and it deals 4d6. A bit less in this spell, but not by much. But the fact that it's a bonus action it makes it far more useful for a spellcaster because it does free up your action to cast more spells. And the range is just way, way better. You can use Transmuted Spell to change the fire damage here if you want. And it's interesting that Transmuted Spell won't affect the resistance or immunity granted by this spell, but it will affect the fire output damage. That, that might be something to consider, I guess. But all that said, this is an interesting choice. <laughs> Damage immunity is something that I think is pretty impactful on its own and shouldn't be overlooked. Despite the fact that some of the other aspects of the spell are pretty bad, that fire immunity is pretty big. And on that, and that alone... I would say that this spell is great when facing creatures that deal fire damage. Forget the other benefits of this spell, right? You probably aren't going to use them. But gaining fire immunity for a 6th level spell slot is still not bad. And actually, I would say is a situationally good spell. Not to mention that fire is a common enough type of damage that I think that this actually might be worth taking. I just wish that you could cast it on allies and not just yourself. But it is what it is. Investiture of Ice. Just like Investiture of Flame and all other Investiture spells that we're going to be covering today, this one lasts 10 minutes and it requires concentration and it takes an action to cast. Just like Investiture of Flame, when this one is active, you get several benefits. You're immune to cold damage and have resistance to fire damage. So like fire, cold damage is very common. So being immune to it is pretty good. So there's that. Now fire is generally more common, but certain campaigns... Uh, cold is actually featured more highly than fire and so like for example rhyme of the frost maiden and so you'll actually be able to benefit from this one a little bit more in terms of that you also aren't affected by difficult terrain that's created by ice or snow it's a very situational benefit and you're basically going to have to know that you're going to be in a lot of snow in order for you to really benefit from this um, you also get a 10 foot radius aura that's difficult terrain for everyone else but you yeah that's all right but 10 feet is just not enough, to be honest. You also get a cone attack that deals 46 cold damage. It deals half damage on a constitution saving throw. And if a creature fails, their movement is halved until the next turn. Um, I think I like this one better than the flame one. Yes, normally I don't like cone effects and normally I don't like constitution. But generally, it does the things that you want it to do. It slows them down. And then this little aura that you get slows them down as well. So this is what you're actually trying to do. If creatures are coming near you, you want to be able to get away as a sorcerer. Most sorcerers are not going to want creatures near them. So being able to slow them with this cone, slow them with your little aura of slowness, I think is far more beneficial than the fire aura and the fire ray that doesn't do any additional side effect. And yes, the damage is less than the fire one and the saving throw is worse than the fire one. It's still, I think, better because of that slowing effect. And don't forget that transmuted spell can actually change your cone attack to something more useful than cold, like thunder damage, let's say. Overall, I think that this spell is a little bit more generally useful than the Investiture of Flame, just because it has those additional benefits to slow creatures from getting near you. So overall, I think I would recommend this one a little bit more highly in more situations than the Fire one, even if I wasn't going to be in an area of cold. I think you can still gain a little bit of benefit from this.
Next up is Investiture of Stone. This is the third Investiture spell that we're going to be discussing today. Investiture of Stone doesn't grant you any immunities at all. It does provide universally better resistance, though. This one sounds great on paper, but consider that this is a concentration spell. <laughs> so if you cast Investiture of Flame, let's say, and you're hit by a breath weapon for 75 fire damage, you take zero damage and you don't have to roll a concentration saving throw. But because this spell only provides resistance, when you get hit, you're going to be making a lot more concentration saves than the other Investiture spells versus the damage type that they give you immunity to. So this one, it's really, really going to test you if you're getting hit round after round. And yeah, you'll be, you'll be taking half damage, but you're going to be making quite a few concentration saves. And eventually this will drop. You will fail your concentration at some point. So this one... This spell suffers from the same problem that the fourth level spell Stone Skin suffers from. Resistance is decent, but the fact that concentration is a thing in this edition, it's not as good as you might think. Now, in addition to the resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, you also get an action, uh, action ability to create an earthquake in a 15-foot radius around you. It doesn't deal damage, but it knocks creatures prone if they fail dexterity saving throw. This is pretty terrible, I'll be honest. It suffers from the same issue of spells like Arms of Hadar from the Warlock spell list. It's supposed to save you when you're surrounded by creatures, but it just doesn't do enough, and a successful save really means that nothing happens to the creatures. You get one more ability, which allows you to move through earth or stone and not suffer the movement pe penalties from difficult terrain caused by earth or stone. The, all the final effects of this spell can be duplicated with lower level spells, and even though they're all combined into one spell, they're just not good enough even combined. I'd hate to be so harsh on this one, but this is quite possibly the worst of the Investiture spells by a long shot. Its only redeeming qualities are the mobility benefits, but that's not enough to justify a 6 level spell slot, and a known spell, which you have very limited number of. Unfortunately, this is just a spell I could not possibly recommend to anybody. The final of the Investiture spells is Investiture of Wind. Like the others, this one lasts 10 minutes with concentration. Ranged weapon attacks have disadvantage to hit you, and you can fly with a 60-foot speed. You also get an action ability that has a 60-foot range, and the point that you target within a 15-foot cube in, around that point, creatures have to make a constitution saving throw, or they're going to take some bludgeoning damage and be pushed 10 feet back from the center of where you targeted this ability. While the constitution save is unfortunate and the damage is kind of low, the secondary effect and the range really make this ability uh, actually pretty good. Just note that distance spell is not going to increase that range uh, past 60 feet, but 60 is not terribly bad, I guess, especially once you consider that you also have a fly speed now. So that's uh, actually not not that bad. Uh, personally, I think this is the best of the investiture spells uh, overall, especially if you're a blasting specialist. I kind of like the investiture of ice a little bit better for certain situations, but overall, I think this is a, the better choice of all the investiture spells. The investiture spells are often grouped together by people as just a group of bad spells of sixth level. And I think that's mostly because there's so many other great spells at this level. But overall, the Investiture of Wind, the Investiture of Ice, and to some degree, the Investiture of Flame are actually pretty good spells in certain situations. And they each come with several nice benefits. The only bad one here is the Investiture of Stone, and that has no redeeming qualities, unfortunately. Flame is the most circumstantial of the three, but fire immunity is something that you can make use of so often that that, that alone makes a strong case for that, for that spell. Ice and wind are actually generally pretty good spells, actually.
Next up is Mass Suggestion. This is one of those spells that can end entire encounters or make important social interactions go the way that you want them to. With a 60 foot range and a duration of 24 hours, this one is really, really powerful. Basically, you offer a course of action for up to 12 creatures. They have to make a wisdom saving throw or they follow the course of action to completion until the spell expires for the duration of the spell. They don't get any additional saving throws if they fail their initial one. This spell gives some examples of suggestions and some of them that even the examples that they give can be pretty game breaking. I don't particularly care for spells that break the game like this and end combats before they begin. So it's not a spell that I would ever use myself. And even though I agree that it's very powerful and some of you may want that, I think it's a spell that you probably aren't going to want to abuse. A dungeon master is given a lot of leeway in regards to their interpretation of this spell. And if you start to abuse this spell, I guarantee you they're going to start interpreting that not in your favor. So they're going to be making a lot of rulings that are going to be detrimental to you. So be very careful, I think, if you're going to be using the spell and abusing it. Use it if you want to. Just don't overdo it. Don't go overboard and, and <laughs> anger your dungeon master. I would say be careful with how you word your suggestions. A clever dungeon master can make it really insignificant if you don't word it properly. A lot of creatures at this level are going to start to have immunity to charm. So abusing this spell is going to be a great way to ensure that just about every creature that you fight is going to be immune to charm in one way or another. Or your dungeon master might start to rule that your suggestions are unreasonable and the spell is going to fail and they will rationalize that. And they are allowed to because they're the dungeon master, right? So warnings aside, I think that this spell can have some pretty great impact on social interactions and combat, limited only by your imagination. Definitely a top tier spell, uh, maybe too good. Heightened spell works great here, but only against one creature of the 12 that you can affect with this spell. So keep that in mind. Use heightened spell on the one that you want to target the most, and then the others are just going to be gravy, I guess. Extended spell does not work on this because it already lasts 24 hours, but you can upcast it and make it last longer that way, up to a year and a day, which is crazy to me. Distance spell is another good choice here, I think, uh, because you can potentially nail more creatures than you would otherwise, as long as it's not more than 12 creatures. So if there are no, if there aren't 12 creatures bunched together within the area of effect with um, distance spell, you can actually nail 12 creatures. If they're a little bit further away from each other, you can still nail more creatures within the area of effect. So that's pretty good. But the best part about using distance spell on this is that you can go beyond the counter spell range, which is huge because then you can use it on a wizard and you can suggest that they don't speak for 24 hours and that's it. They're not going to be able to do anything and they're not going to be able to counter it. Um, subtle spell actually does work on this one and you can potentially cast this without anyone around noticing you. So if you're at the king's court, let's say you can cast subtle spell and cast it on the king without the guards noticing. So check with your dungeon master, though. Some dungeon masters require that you have some sort of telepathic ability in order to convey the message that you want it to convey before this spell works. So check with your dungeon master before you do something like that. Anyway, this is a great spell. I do highly recommend it. Just don't break your game with it. Next up is Mental Prison. This one is a pretty cool spell. Through and through, it's a control spell done with some flair. It lasts a minute, has a 60 foot range. It does require concentration. You can only target one creature with it, and it has to make an intelligence saving throw, which is my favorite saving throw to target. If the creature fails the saving throw or is immune to charm, it still takes 5d10 psychic damage, which is nothing to sneeze at. If it fails, it's restrained and effectively blind, but it doesn't suffer the blinded condition, and this is important. 
it's actually better than suffering the blinded condition because even creatures with blind sight and echolocation can't see or e hear anything beyond its space. Tremor sense, though, probably is not going to be affected by this spell, but at least creatures with blind sight are still not going to be able to see your allies or yourself. So automatically what that means is your allies are going to have advantage to hit the creature because they are not going to be seen by this creature, right? So they're going to be an easy punching bag for your allies and they have to make a choice. They either have to keep taking hits by your allies or try and get out of the spell and get take a ton of damage from it. Here's one thing. I say check with your dungeon master. Some dungeon masters interpret this differently and they rule that blind, blindside and echolocation still work within the effects uh, and they aren't affected by this. Even though I don't agree with those interpretations, your dungeon master is the final arbiter of those rules, so I defer to their judgment. Based on the reading of this, uh, I my interpretation is there's it's pretty clear that even creatures with blind sight are not going to be able to see you, but again, check with your dungeon master. Either way, regardless, once the creature fails a saving throw, if the creature moves or attacks, it immediately takes 10d10 psychic damage. Ouch! That is a ton of damage. And even better, they still take the damage even, even if they were moved against their will. The spell is great all around. It targets one of the best saving throws in intelligence. It deals great damage even if the creature succeeds their saving throw. And it deals one of the best damage types in the game. It also serves as a great control and debuff spell. Extended spell can really help here. It can keep the creature locked down for two minutes instead of one. It's not a whole lot, but it can come in handy in certain situations. Distance spell and subtle spell are also great choices here because they can prevent counter spell. Uh, heightened spell and twin spell are going to be the real winners, though. Twin spell is very expensive with six sorcery points, but holy cow, it might be worth it. Um, of course, empowered spell can also be pretty good, upping your damage output, but not as good as it is on a spell with a large area of effect. Next up is Move Earth. This one is generally a great utility spell for wizards, but I think it's not as good for sorcerers. You can alter dirt, clay, and earth in a large area for a long duration of two hours. That's a really weird duration, two hours. As far as I can think, this is the only spell with a two-hour duration in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Most spells do either last around a minute, 10 minutes, an hour, or 8 hours, or 24 hours. Two-hour duration is very, very strange and very uncommon in this game. And I can't really figure out why they chose this number, <laughs> to be honest. Anyway, even though it just takes one action to cast a spell, the changes that you make when you use it take 10 minutes to take effect. So this makes it strictly a utility spell and a very circumstantial one at that. If you've been watching this Sorcerer class series, you know that by now circumstantial spells are not worth taking in a sorcerer generally. In fact, I recommend taking a more universally useful spell that is a lower level spell than this one. And that spell is Wall of Stone. Not only can you do a lot with what you want to do with this spell, but it also works great in combat. And you don't have to use it on clay or earth or sand. Wall of Stone works everywhere. So skip this spell and take Wall of Stone instead. It's going to be more generally useful in more situations as well. Then go ahead and choose another spell for level 6 instead of this one. Again, not because this is a bad spell, but for a sorcerer, it definitely is a bad choice, I think. Uh, I think wizards can make great use of a spell like this one, but leave it to the wizards, since they don't have a limited number of known spells, and they can afford to have circumstantial spells like this one.
Next up is Scatter. I love this spell. This is such a cool spell. Basically, it lets you rearrange the battlefield to your advantage by teleporting up to five creatures within 30 feet onto any space within 120 feet. So essentially, you can teleport allies, enemies, or a mix of both. And if it's an enemy and they're not willing, they can make a wisdom saving throw to resist it. Um, and if they fail, they still get teleported. If they succeed, they're not teleported. Rearranging the battlefield is something that is so impactful. It can really change a combat and, and the dynamics of a combat. It can swing things your way tremendously. If you're swarmed by enemies or something, swap places with the barbarian. Or an enemy wizard is being guarded by some tough guards, teleport the cards far away from them or teleport the wizard right in the middle of a year fighter and barbarian. You can swap range attackers with melee attackers back and forth that make the range attackers appear in melee range of your of your fighters and make their melee attackers far away. So they're going to have to run and dash and climb down or whatever to get to you guys. Um, you can separate enemies, making it easier for your group to deal with them. Or if things aren't going your way, you can teleport the party far away enough to get away. This spell can turn a combat into your favor, no question. But it's also great for utility. But it's also great for utility. You can teleport all of your allies with just one casting. And I know that a spell like Arcane Gate can do a similar thing. But Arcane Gate requires that, you, that the people move through the gate themselves or be dragged through. With this spell, they're instantly teleported. So if three of your allies have gone down in combat and they're making death saves, you can use this spell to teleport them to safety and they don't have to walk on their own or be dragged through an arcane gate. Now, as far as metamagic, distance spell increases the area that you can target creatures in, but not the distance that they're teleported. Heightened spell can be handy if you really need to ensure an enemy is affected by this spell. You know, um, not too many other metamagics are really going to work great with this, but overall, I'd say this is a great spell. I've used it on a couple of characters already. Every time I cast it, the group was blown away about what a big difference this spell made. So I highly recommend it. Sunbeam. This spell is deceptively good. It takes one action to cast and lasts a minute, and it does require concentration. What it does is it grants you an action ability to shoot a 60-foot line of radiant damage. Normally, I think 60 foot is not that good, and usually I think that line spells are really difficult to position. Inside close quarters and tight rooms, it actually works great to avoid friendly fire. By now, you probably know that I think radiant is one of the strongest damage types in the game, but you also know that I hate constitution saving throws because they're so highly resisted by enemies. So if this was a one and done type of spell, like a single blast that allowed for a constitution saving throw, I would say that's a deal breaker. This spell is no good and be done with it. But the fact that every round you can use an action to deal 68 radiant damage without using any more spell slots, I think it's so good that even the constitution saving throw doesn't really bother me on this one. Not only is 68 Radiant every round better than the damage from Investiture of Flame and Storm Sphere, but it has the potential to hit multiple foes over a 60-foot line, and a successful save still means half damage, so you're still dealing some damage every single round. Even if you only hit two enemies on average each round, which is not unreasonable from a 60-foot line, that's 12 D8 damage that you're doing every single round. That's awesome. It's too bad that distance spell doesn't extend the range of this spell. Because again, 60 feet is not great. Uh, but distance spell would have made this better if it worked. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Now, empowered spell can be amazing here. And you can use it every round by spending the sorcery points each time. That can be get pretty expensive. But hey, you can be dealing potentially quite a bit of damage. This spell is honestly really underrated. And with only one spell slot, it can potentially deal more damage than most other spells over an entire combat. 
in big dungeons, spells that save your spell slots are super valuable, and this is one of those. Now, that said, extended spell is not a good choice to use on this spell since it only lasts a minute, and doubling that to two minutes is probably not going to be very helpful, and the spell doesn't really upscale very well. But honestly, I think if this spell upscaled, it would probably be too strong. As an additional benefit, you also shed light over 60 feet and 30 foot, 30 foot bright and 30 foot um, dim. But uh, specifically, it's sunlight, which is interesting. It's it's great against certain types of creatures, such as like drow and kobolds and vampires, because then they basically are going to have disadvantage because of their sunlight sensitivity. So uh, an interesting little added benefit that was not really necessary, but it's nice that it's there. So I highly recommend this spell. Next up is Tasha's Otherworldly Guys. This is a weird spell. It's basically a spell that gives you some defense and some capabilities for melee combat. It takes a bonus action to cast and it lasts a minute, requiring concentration. You get to pick what you want to embody, like lower planes or upper planes. Lower planes is definitely the more useful one since it gets your immunity to fire and poison damage and the poison condition, both of which are still pretty common even at this high level. You can fly and then you can get an AC bonus, which is pretty decent. Your weapon attacks are considered magical. You can use your charisma modifier since you're a sorcerer uh, for the attack and damage rolls to get, and you get two attacks per round. Something to note here in the text is that it doesn't say anything about granting you proficiency in other weapons. So you're still gonna be, you're gonna be attacking with your charisma bonus, but you're still gonna be attacking with no proficiency bonus if, say, you're holding a longsword, unless you happen to be proficient in. So getting a plus five if your charisma is 20, plus five to attack, but with no proficiency bonus, you're not going to be that good at hitting, even with two attacks per round. Keep that in mind, because this spell very specifically does not grant you proficiency in weapons. What is the point of, the, of giving you this ability? I don't understand. But I guess either way, you're a sorcerer, so the last thing you're going to want to be doing is attacking with weapons anyway. So this benefit is honestly pretty pointless. But even without that, I think the spell is still pretty good. You get some immunities, and you're, that, that already is really powerful, like fire and poison, right? But having a fly speed and an extra AC bonus is it's actually extra gravy. That's really good. It would be better if the duration was a little bit longer. But basically, the duration makes this mostly like a combat uh, spell versus a utility spell. I do like that it's a bonus action casting. That's actually pretty big. But overall, I think the immunities alone make the spell worth the spell slot. The added fly speed make this a great spell for a blaster. So I think this is a good one. Just because it grants you a dumb benefit that you're probably ne never going to use with that weapon attack bonus doesn't make this a bad spell. A bad benefit in a spell that has otherwise good benefits still make it a good spell. So I think I would recommend this spell. And finally, we have True Seeing. This one is a fantastic utility spell that lasts a full hour without the need for concentration. What it does is basically it grants True Sight on whoever you cast this on. And in case you don't know what True Sight does, uh, you can see in normal and magical darkness, you can see invisible things, including creatures. 
You automatically succeed on saving throws versus illusions. You can detect visual illusions and you can see the true form of any creature even if they're naturally a shape changer. There's really not much else to say here, except that it's even better that you can cast it on someone else and not just yourself. And you can uh, see up to 120 feet into the ethereal plane. That's pretty awesome. Getting true sight is huge at this level where things are gonna be creating illusions or you're gonna be fighting shape changers and things like that, or things are gonna be invisible. So that is really, really good and you're gonna benefit from this countless times this is definitely a good pick of a spell most utility spells are circumstantial and i don't recommend them for sorcerers but this is like one of those exceptions because it's so universally good that i think you'll benefit from it almost every session extended spell is great with this one and twin spell is pretty awesome it's expensive at six sorcery points but having two creatures with true sight in your group is amazing this one's a good pick assuming that you have everything else that you need to round out your character for this level So six level spells have some winners and some losers uh, looking at you, Investiture of Stone. But even some of the best six level spells have some undesirable features, which is kind of weird. Like a lot of the six level spells have some great things and then some undesirable things. But even with the in undesirable things, the great things are so good that it makes the spell still worth it. Your choices are definitely going to be difficult when selecting six level spells, but keep in mind that about your concentration requirements that's always going to be important as a sorcerer uh, especially uh, if you have too many spells in your repertoire that require concentration it may be something that you want to look into either replacing or maybe not taking a spell another one that requires concentration so next i'm gonna be listing the spells in the categories and which ones i recommend and highly recommend which ones are good choices and which ones are circumstantially good source choices uh, and also, which ones I don't recommend at all. Investiture of Stone. And that does it for today's video on six level wizard spells. Uh, what are your thoughts? I would like to hear your thoughts on my analysis of these spells. Did I miss something? Did Was I wrong about one of them? Maybe there's something I'm missing about a good use for one or overrating one of them. Let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Next uh, video, we'll be doing the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer. And then we'll also be making a video for the seventh level uh, Sorcerer spells. We're almost done with the spell spell videos but uh in between i will be starting to break down each sorcerer subclass so look out for those uh 
if you have not subscribed to the channel and you like this type of content, definitely click subscribe so that you can see whenever I post a new video. Thank you guys very much. As always, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments down below. And I'll talk to you next time. As always, I am your innkeeper from the Twisted Tentacle Inn. Check in anytime. I'll talk with you then.